Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 69, and what we're going to start is our discussion of energy. More specifically, we're going to talk about kinetic energy today. Now, energy is defined as the ability to do work. When an object has energy, it can work on its surroundings and change the environment around it. So objects that have energy can do work when they hit into other things or collide with other things. So energy and momentum are, con are importantly linked in this section. Specifically though, when we talk about energy, we have two types in this course. We're going to have stored energy and we're going to have energy in motion. Stored energy is known as potential energy. And energy in motion is what we're going to define as kinetic energy. So the way we're going to use energy in terms of a unit is the joule. And joules, remember from the section before, was also the unit for work. Now work and energy are interchangeable as long as there's no friction involved. But when friction takes its um, toll, what's going to happen is energy will be lost in the system. So we're going to start with regular energy and talk about the different types, and then we're going to move into conservation of energy, ultimately being able to solve problems of different types. Now this is all part of dynamics, which is why things move. And things move because they have energy. Before we talked about the reason things move because of forces. What we're doing is looking at different ways objects are moving in our universe and having different ways that we can solve for variables that we're concerned with. In this case, we're going to look at energy. Now, the formula for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. And the good part about energy in this case, and kinetic energy specifically, is that the v is the speed of the object. So we're not going to have to worry about directions. It may be more um, feasible to solve problems using energy rather than forces or velocities because those need directions as well. So in this case we have a scalar quantity which is going to allow us to solve problems that may be more difficult using other methods. And as we're gaining more information and more content, what you can do is decide what is the most effective way to solve different problems. I don't want you to always fall back on the ones that you're familiar with because I want you to learn the new content. But as we move forward in the course, and especially when we review for assessments, you're going to be able to decide what's the easiest way to solve a particular problem. Now with our equation, 1 half mv squared, the m is measured in kilograms, and the v, the speed, is meters per second. So you end up getting a situation where when you square the meters per second, you end up with meters squared over seconds squared. Well, what happens is when you multiply that by the kilograms, you have kilogram meters squared over second squared. If we pull out one of the meters on the top, you end up with kilogram meter over second squared. Well, remember, that was the unit for newtons. Well, newtons times meters was the units for work. So newtons times meter is a joule. So the units work themselves out to be the same as the joule, and that's why it's going to be useful for us to use them interchangeably. In fact, we have a theorem called the work energy theorem, which allows us to substitute one in for the other if there's no friction involved. Now in this case, because it's speed, we don't have to worry about direction, and you can just figure out the kinetic energy of an object based on how fast it's going. So all you need to know is the mass of the object and how quickly it's moving, and you can figure out the kinetic energy. Now that being said, because there's a squared in this equation, it's a perfect target for assessments dealing with relationships between variables. So what we have is situations where we can calculate the relationship between a variable if we double a certain thing or triple a certain variable in the equation. Remember. If you're going to deal with changing the variables, put a 1 everywhere it stays the same, so mass or velocity, or I'm sorry, speed, and change the other variable by putting in a 2 or a half or a third or a 4 or whatever the number happens to be. Now in this case, the mass is directly related to the kinetic energy because they're both on the same level of the equation and there's no squared term. And the velocity is directly squared related to the kinetic energy. So if I were to double the velocity, I'm actually increasing the kinetic energy by four times. So if you double the speed of an object, you're actually giving it four times as much energy as it had originally. 
Now, that being said, if we look at a couple of examples, if I were to double the mass of an object, I would put 2 for m, 1 for v, so 2 times 1 squared gets me 2, so it would double. If I were to double the speed, mass would be 1, the speed would be 2 squared, so it would be 1 times 4, and it would be 4 times bigger, as I stated earlier. Finally, if we do one where we have the masses halved, 1 half for m, and we double the velocity, 2 squared, 1 half times 4 yields 2. So if I were to double the mass, um, oh, I'm sorry, have the mass and double the speed, I would actually increase the kinetic energy two times. Let's do a couple of sample problems dealing with kinetic energy. At this point, you're so versed in solving equations that this should be pretty easy for you. Let's solve for some kinetic energies and see how we can do. Let's take out the whiteboard now and do those problems. All right, for this next problem, let's look at a smart car and find the kinetic energy at different speeds. We're going to look at 55 miles per hour, 65 miles per hour, and 75 miles per hour. And the weight of the smart car is 1588 pounds. Now, the most important part of this problem is to first convert the pounds and the miles per hour. I'll start with the pounds. 1588 pounds, one pound is 0.4536 kilograms. So pounds will cancel. 1588 times 0.4536 gets me 720.3 kilograms. So that's the weight we're going to use. Now, 55 miles per hour means I have to multiply one mile is 1609 meters and one hour is 3600 seconds. So the hours will cancel, the miles will cancel, and we'll be left with meters per second. 55 times 1609 divided by 3600 gets me 24.6 meters per second. If I replace that number with 65, it would be 65 times 1609 divided by 3600. And I get 29.05 meters per second. And then finally, if I replace that 65 with a 75, that would be 75 times 1609 divided by 3600 and that's 33.52 meters per second. So in each case we have the mass and we have the velocity. So kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So Ke equals one half 720.3 kilograms times 24.6 meters per second. Now the biggest mistake that people make is they forget to square the entire unit. If you don't have the parentheses and you write the squared close to the seconds, it might look like an acceleration unit. So make sure you put that in parentheses and square that number. So 0.5 times 720.3 times 24.6 squared. I'm going to get 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 joules of energy. Now that's at 55 miles per hour. At 65 miles per hour, I would do 0.5 times 720.3 times 29.05 squared. And I'm going to get 3.04 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 fifth joules. And that was 65 miles per hour. Now finally, I need to get 75. I'm going to write it down here. 
So it's 1 half times 720.3 times, and instead of 24.6, I'm putting 33.52 squared. And I'm getting 4.05 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 joules. So everyone has the same exponent, 10 to the 5th, but we go from 2 to 3 to 4 um, times 10 to the 5 joules, and that was 75. So changing your velocity by 10 miles per hour each time increases it by over 100,000, um, or just about 100,000 every single time. Now, when we're talking about joules, that's something that's difficult to, uh, for us to grasp. So what I want to do is relate these numbers that we just found with the smart car into how high we would have to lift it to do the same amount of work. Now remember, work is force times distance. So the work is going to be the amount of energy that it has. The force is going to be fighting gravity. Now if 720.3 is in the box, the force of gravity is going to be 720.3 times 9.8 or 7059 newtons. So if I'm trying to find the work, which is 2.2 times 10 to the 5 joules equals 7059 times D, how high would I have to pull a car vertically in order to find the same amount of energy. So if I do 2.2 second E5 divided by 7059, I would have to lift the car, the D would be 31.2 meters above the ground. Now that's a more concrete value for us. Remember, buildings are approximately 10 feet per story. Now 10 feet is going to be around three meters. Well, three meters means we're lifting this, if we divide that by three, at least 10 stories into the air. So we're talking about lifting it to a building that's about 10 floors high. Now, if we do the same thing for 65, all we're gonna change is the 3.04 times 10 to the five joules. It's gonna have the same force of gravity, so we're overcoming the same number, and we're gonna get 3.04 second E5 divided by 7059, we're lifting it 43 meters in the air. Now that's even higher. Finally, for 75, 4.05 times 10 to the 5 joules, 7059 times D. 4.05 E5 divided by 7059, and now we're lifting it 57.4 meters into the air. So we're talking about an increasing amount of height to have the same amount of work that we're talking about for these values for driving the car. So even as we increase the speed by 10 miles per hour in each time, we're increasing it by a significant amount in terms of the energy that it has and also in terms of how much work it would take or how high it would be if we did the same amount of work lifting the car vertically. So cars have a lot of energy traveling at 55 miles an hour, and that's when they have um, a fairly small car like, like the smart car.